Oh, boy, that was a, a very kind introduction. Thank you, Tyler, and uh, it's my honor to be here with all of you, and, and I'm glad that we had a, uh, a, a nice remembrance of July 4th today. I hope you all had as a great a holiday as I did, and uh, it's obviously the most important holiday for me. <coughs> Our family had to, had to flee communism 51 years ago, about a week before July 4th of 1960. And, uh, and it, it's one of the primary reasons why, other than totally falling in love with this great country, that it's such a special place for us. Imagine, if you will, three generations of families, you know, living by the law, raising a family, and uh, building up proudly businesses that you've worked 24-7, as I said, for, for three generations since the independence of a country. And all of a sudden, someone coming taking everything you own, shutting down your church, and depriving you of every, every freedom and liberty that every human being born on this earth should be entitled to. And, and finally, incarcerating members of your family and creating a condition where you've got to flee your homeland. I was 12 at the time and, and recall coming to America uh, and recall, you know, my, my, my parents and, and grandparents' sadness and and losing everything they had worked so hard for, and at the same time, their gratitude in, in coming to the most special place in the world. <clears throat> I don't remember, in the midst of all of this, my family ever complaining about this. And uh, throughout the years, I kind of came to, <coughs> excuse me, un I get a little emotional, <laughs> understand why, and, and that's because, you know, we gave up everything, uh, and in order to really come to a place that that no man has ever uh, created uh, better or or in a more special place, uh, what saddens me sometimes it's the what we came to understand uh, the nation that embraced us and and truly appreciated how not everyone really day to day gets on their knees and thanks God for living in the greatest miracle that man has created. Thank you. And uh, July 4th allows me to do that. <coughs> and there's not a July 4th that I don't find the time to explain to or remind my kids and my grandkids now of what this date means to the Cardinals family. And uh, I'd celebrate we should. And at the same time, it's a good time to reflect uh, our country, especially since the 1960s when, when I came here. Uh, the America I came to in 1960 was the America where over 90 percent of families decided to have a dad and a mom and raise their kids. It was the America where we clearly left our front door open and when the stranger knocked we invited them in to have a cup of coffee and, and see what we could do to help them. When the church called we, we said what can we do to help. And uh, the people mostly lived within their means. They saved to buy their home. Uh, they paid the price they could afford. And by and large, lived within their means. And that included, by and large, their government. And in the 60s, America started a great experiment that's truly divided us where we are today. It's the experiment of the great society. We decided to experiment with drugs. Live and let live became our motto. Uh, open relationships became the hip thing of the times. And government should have such a heart that it uh, would spend beyond its means to the point of providing such a safety net that it made more sense for people not to work than to work. Uh, and, and that's the America that we've embark embarked on for the last 50 some years. And we truly are at a crossroads. And that's why I wanted to talk to you about the first 100 days of, of 2013. And, how critical it is to this great nation that all of us love so much. And I know I'm speaking to the choir because that's why you're here, to see what you individually can do to help this country continue to be the greatest experiment uh, that mankind has ever come about. But it's truly losing a lot of what made it special, the self-reliance, the self-respect, the love of God, the love of country that, that has made us such a great place. And yes, we still are a country of exceptionalism. And yes, when you, when you look at on Memorial Day at, uh, 
at, uh, at our, and respect our fallen and respect our military, you do realize that there's no other place in the world still. But at the same token, those very same conditions that our founding fathers uh, found to be a preeminent uh, a necessity to have this space as special as, as they are, those foundations are being rocked in ways that I never imagined. And, and I look at it not just from a standpoint of government, but from a standpoint of our social fabric. And uh, today, uh, we're fighting uh, two great battles, one dealing with our social fabric and the other dealing with, with, uh, with government and, and, and how we're going to look as a nation moving forward. Uh, one of those battles is in the traditional family arena for no other reasons that, that it's really the center plate to to all of the geo, you know, Judeo-Christian traditions that founded our nation. And, uh, and if you look at the social experiments of the day, you will find that uh, you know, instead of those 90% plus homes with a dad and a mom, it's way below 50 now and almost under 25% in certain communities and, and in certain areas. And uh, it stands to reason that there's a direct relationship between, between our social fabric and the challenges that we're facing in our country. Uh, the full jails, the percentage of folks who are not completing their education, the despair, the drug addiction, all of which are part of a feeling of hollowness inside of far too many people that we care for and love who have lost their way. And, and government needs to, lose, needs to lead the way, it doesn't need to confuse the way. And so fighting for traditional marriage to me is is, is a fight we all need to join because it's, it's not the only, but it's really at the center of the American family and, and the American tradition. Uh, the other is this fight about, uh, about uh, putting our, our government back in shape and this cut, cap, and balance idea uh, that we're fighting for is essential to our well-being and survival as, as the world's greatest economy. Just think about what we're facing today. We have a White House that's proposing a $3.7 trillion budget, I believe, 40% of which is to be paid with borrowed money. Our country now has a debt-to-GDP to ratio over 25%, nearing 30%. We've doubled our national debt in a couple of years. Just think about it. Uh, ever since our founding, it took us all that time to add our national debt, and now we've almost doubled it in two years, and, and have prospects for future debt growth that are that are scary and and yet we look at Paul Ryan and I watch TV and and uh, I hear the commentators call what he has in mind as radical and frankly for me it's not enough I mean Paul Ryan's coming up with a proposal which basically said you know we ought to have a balanced budget in about 10 years and we ought to bring down our debt to GDP ratio to about 18 percent which is what all economists suggest or all respectable economists suggest is a reasonable place to be in terms of having a thriving economy, and yet it will take us almost a generation. Those of you in your 20s, it will take you 28 years, think about it, to get to that point to correct the wrongs of the last few years. And, and people call that radical, and I say, you know, it's really not enough. I mean, to, I've got, uh, we've got five children, we're blessed with five children, all in their 20s, except the oldest who's 31. And, and that, that means that for their whole productive life, or most of their productive life, they're going to be sad, uh, saddled with a debt to, you know, the debt to GDP ratio that's not acceptable or competitive in today's environment. And, uh, you know, the, this is not a two or three year typical cycle that we all hoped some time ago it would be, hey, we've had our ups, we had our downs, but we always come out of our cycles. So it's a very different cycle, very different cycle. 14 million Americans unemployed. Uh, the only quasi-healthy thing we have is the you know, S&P index. And you know why? That's because 40% of the revenue stream from S&P American companies now comes from abroad. Almost doubled what it was, or more than doubled what it was 20 years ago. That means that when Americans and companies owned primarily by Americans are in their boardroom, they take the capital of that company and decide that they best invest in Brazil or China or India or elsewhere because that's where the economies are thriving and the rate of returns are the most competitive, not here in America. And we can't convince people with, uh, with their capital and their money 
to invest here because we have a government that's decided that 50 percent of the American people are not going to pay taxes. Forty percent of our spending is going to be out of debt because we can't generate enough money to pay for this ever-growing economy. And yet, you know, we've gotten to that point where there really are two Americas. There's America to the left that believes in live and let live and, and let folks do what they want to do. If it feels good, that's great. And yeah, you know, we have a great heart, so we're going to pay today with the money from our children and grandchildren. And entitlement programs, hey, we're going to give you more than we can afford, but that's great because, you know, we can look at you and say we took care of you. Well, how about taking care of my children and my grandchildren and your grandchildren and your children? And, and what we're about today is really there's no, you know, the art of compromise, which is, you know, the media standard quote for what they consider be the ideal politician is not an appropriate term in the world we live in. There are two thoughts in America. We really are at our crossroads. You either take that, to your, that road to your left where you say, okay, well, you know, all the social conditions and the Ten Commandments and the Judeo-Christian traditions of our founding fathers are no longer in play, and hey, it's a new world, and let's just live the way the new world wants to live, and let government do deal with this irresponsibly, and as much as it can borrow, let them make us all feel good. And if you want to stay home, we're going to take good care of you if you don't want to work. Uh, or the America to say, look, there are a lot of countries out there hungry, growing exponentially beyond what we're growing. Uh, you know, that giant in China is breathing down our neck. If you see the growth of economies in India, Brazil, Germany, China, puts America's growth to shame. And, uh, you know, we need to get our country back to its traditional values, to, to its sensible spending. More people need to participate in, in, in the role of government by paying fair taxes. And we need to get our country into a sensible place. It's not very difficult. It's not rocket science, the things that we need to do. The only thing that we're lacking is a will and courage to make it happen. And so this year, when everybody's predicting that, uh, you know, by touching entitlement programs, we've doomed ourselves for the 2012 elections. My answer is, if you can't look at somebody who's 55 or 65 and older and let them know that the only way they can be entitled to, to their benefits and the only way they can live in the kind of America that many of them fought for and thrive for is to agree to plans that responsibly uh, uh, save our nation from its doom that are allow us to pay for their medical benefits in the f now and in 20, 10, 20, 30 years from now. And the only program that preserves the things that they want, the safety nets that they want, are the programs that we're proposing. If they heed the word of the other side, uh, they're going to feel good for five or ten years until their medical bills can't no longer be paid and the whole system crumbles. Uh, we have to have the courage to look at these people in the eye and ask them to do the right thing for America. And uh, we can't save our country without, without taking some medicine and righting the wrongs that have been taking place. And if we don't have the courage to be persuasive with the American people, then we don't deserve to win. But there is a call to battle, and there is no art of compromise. We either save America or we don't. And by compromising halfway, we don't save America. And so I, uh, I'm grateful that my colleagues uh, including Morton Blackwell, for whom I have more respect than you'll ever know, have uh, entrusted me with the leadership of this great organization that I dearly love. You know, it's the first, cons it was cons first organization created in the movement 48 years ago. Its board of directors, including Morton, are who's who in, in the American conservative movement and include folks who come from uh, think tanks, uh, conservative publications, uh, uh, important tax groups, uh, uh, folks fighting for the Second Amendment, a compendium of, of great patriots who, who, are, who participate in organizations just like the Leadership Institute who want to save America and, and keep it the great nation it is. And I'm humbled that for reasons I still don't understand, they asked me to <coughs> take this on for, because I truly do feel that there are folks perhaps far more qualified than I am. The only thing I can tell you is that there's not a waking day in my life where I don't have a, 
a burning flame for love and passion for this country. So I'm truly honored by this. <coughs> I'm delighted that I've been given this opportunity. And the American Conservative Union is embarking on a new mission because the task at hand is too, too great to, to stand by. And so we've, we've decided to take CPAC around the country. We're going to do uh, two CPACs uh, in uh, this year. Uh, one in Florida, in Orlando, uh, in late September, and one in Chicago in November, uh, on the uh, third anniversary of President Obama's speech, the day he got elected and what he promised America, because we want to go to Chicago and tell America what he's done to it uh, and uh, compare his promises to the reality of his, of his, uh, of his policies and, and, uh, and what's happened to our country since he took charge. Uh, we're going to have a regular CPAC in February, of course, here in D.C., which is our pride and joy, and, and do quite a few more next year before the cycle ends. Uh, you know, our, our, one of our greatest sources of pride, of course, is keeping the brand, the conservative brand, in check with our elected officials, which is why we do the, uh, why we do the yearly rating of congressional members, and, and that conservative index seems to have been the gold standard for many years. Well, we think we ought to do that at the state levels as well. Uh, if somebody calls themselves a conservative, they ought to walk the walk. And so we're going to go to the states, and we're going to rank the members as well. Now, that's a more significant assignment that all of you may believe, because selecting the process by which you rank somebody and doing it well and fairly is a complicated process. So we're going to start uh, with five states this year, uh, North Carolina and Florida, Ohio, uh, Virginia and North and uh, Nevada, and uh, you know, in, in Virginia, I know that Mr. and Mrs. Black will have been fighting the good fight. They're, not everybody is a believer in the conservative movement who who wears the R label. Uh, they do, and so we're going to help them to find in, in Virginia who are the true conservatives and who are not in the state legislature. And that we'll do that. We'll start out this year with five states, and every year we'll will grow until we, we have the ability to cover most of the country. And, uh, and then the third thing that, uh, that we're immediately doing is getting in contact with the various Tea Party leaderships around the country, and that's complicated. By last count, there are 20-some hundred Tea Party uh, organizations around America, and they're looking for some context, and, uh, and I think that they truly want to have a toolbox at their disposal. And because of the opportunities created by the new media for us to contact each other uh, in a much more efficient manner, I believe that they're here to stay, and they're here to be an important part of our landscape, and they're as passionate as everyone in this room is about being a patriot and doing what's right for America. So we, we hope to bring them into the process. Uh, we're spending quite a bit of time doing exactly that, and, uh, and I think that's, that's helpful for the conservative movement as we move forward to find a cohesive way, perhaps through this toolbox mechanism to do that. And lastly, we have a dream about creating a, a virtual university for uh, not for the folks who, who want to take a graduate course in poli-sci at Stanford, but, but for the folks who, who work hard or maybe stay at home who, who are passionate and want to be more helpful and understand better the whys and wherefores of where conservative stands on, on, on key issues. So we've got a lot to do. There's a lot at stake in America. It truly is at a crossroads. And let me finalize this by saying that hopefully the House of Representatives will keep America for digging us uh, into a further hole. Uh, but there's very little that having one chamber out of two and not having the White House where you can do to actually start getting out of that hole. Uh, and so and my point is uh, I, I look to, I visualize the first hundred days where we truly have a cut, cap, and balance, where we truly restore uh, the preservation of, of traditional marriage and get the Attorney General once again defend the laws of this country, uh, like constitutionally he should, and where we once again uh, uh, take steps to make America less energy dependent on, on, on foreign sources and where we once again begin to make, take sensible steps uh, to properly get our nation positioned to be competitive in the world through deregulation, through a fairer tax system, to all of the things that we conservatives dream about but can't do because we have neither the will nor the numbers to accomplish it. So 
I look forward to embarking on that mission with you. I look forward to making a reality of that visual that we have about those first 100 days in 2013 and what they could look like. And I thank you for the chance to be here with you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. You mentioned social experiments as in the society at large. Uh, unfortunately, there there was a, a fair amount of social experiment at the American Conservative Union too. So, uh, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I wanted to um, to ask you to uh, to address the issue. What? Um, how do you um, how do you intend to make the American Conservative Union more reflective of the conservative grassroots? Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, you know, I want to narrow that down, if you don't mind. I uh, I think the issue you're referring to is the admission of a, of a gay group as a co-sponsor of our last debate, uh, uh, and. Uh, you know, that was done, uh, frankly, in, in the midst of uh, a very, uh, I'm not too sure that decision encompassed the will of a majority of the board members. And I'm not going to sit here and, and be, a, I guess, a dictator and tell you what I pro propose it'll be. But I can assure you that I have a different mindset than the earlier mindset about that issue. And, uh, and my sense is that if, if you view life like I do, you'll, you'll be pleased with the decisions we make moving forward in that regard. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, we're well aware of the fact that the Democrats, for my lifetime, have always been tax and spend. However, also in my lifetime, I've seen Republicans are right. borrow and spend. Ronald Reagan, the great president, proposed and signed into legislation eight budgets that were in deficit. He tripled the national debt in his eight years. Bush 41, Bush 43 uh, also s signed 12 bills uh, of, of spending that were in deficit. Uh, Bush 43 and Hastert and DeLay were spending money like drunken sailors and borrowing all the money. Going forward, why should I have any confidence in voting Republican? Well, you know, you've got to examine history in its proper context at the appropriate time. There have been times in our nation when deficit spending was appropriate. World War I, World War II come to mind, and the Cold War that, uh, and the arms race that we were face, facing with the Soviet Union, who was clearly intent on destroying us and the free world militarily, was another one. And so you will find that uh, Ronald Reagan's, uh, you know, growth, uh, you know, had a lot to do with uh, with a very expensive military budget at a time when Soviet Union more and us dictated what our needs were in that regard. Uh, I don't think we have any excuse for what the the you know the Bush years came about. I think all of us are critical. We're true conservatives of the spending habits of our Republican majority in those years. Uh, the uh, I think many of us are of deference to. The fact that it wasn't a Democrat in office uh, did not maybe voice our opinions as strongly as we should have. And, uh, and I think we've learned a lot over the last few years in taking pause over, over this. And I think the growth of the Tea Party movement was reflective of precisely what you're saying, and that is a mistrust of both political parties to make the right choices for the American people. Uh, you know, and then there's, you know, there are. There are plenty of complicated reasons why one third of the American public now registers as independent, but a simple answer is that they're not happy with either alternative. Uh, we, on the other hand, don't call ourselves conservatives. Uh, 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 we, we don't call ourselves Republican. This is not the Republican Leadership Institute, although more than I have been uh, proud to, to have helped the party that comes closest to our value system. The American Conservative Union doesn't call itself the American Republican Conservative Union. Uh, we wish that, uh, that we could invite many more Democrat leaders because they spouse our, our beliefs. 
it would make America stronger. Uh, but, but that is just not the case. The truth of the matter is that the Democrat Party has shed itself of, uh, of any semblance of moderation or, or conservatives. And so all that's left to their party is the Nancy Pelosi wing of the Democrat Party. And so, you know, it's hard to find one Democrat that we could truly look at and say they're worthy of coming to CPAC and addressing the country. It's not because they're a Democrat, but it's because of what they stand for. At the same token, we t we're going to take a similar position if you're just because you're a Republican does not mean that you're worthy of standing at a podium in a conservative organization. Uh, we expect you to be a conservative Republican. And uh, frankly, I'm proud of the freshman class. They may not be as polished, but they sure have their heart in the right place. And so uh, that's kind of my, my view. Given that the, uh, we have a Democratic president and a democratically controlled Senate, what do you think our House leadership of the Republican Party should do with the upcoming debt negotiations that are going on now? Yeah, boy, you know, the, uh, there are obviously two trends of thoughts amongst uh, more conservative thinkers. One is that, uh, well, we just stand our ground, and, you know, without the House, you can move forward, and if we, and if we, enter into a situation where, where we're in violation of, of our debt obligations, uh, so be it. And, uh, and then there's another group that says, oh my gosh, you know, we can't do that. That would be so irresponsible. And as much as we dislike what's going on, we've got to cut the best deal we can. Well, I don't think we can cut the best deal we can unless we're ready to step into that phantom of, of potential default. And so... Uh, I, for, for that reason, I thought that, frankly, our, our speaker perhaps acted a little quickly the last time we had an opportunity to have some leverage, and we didn't really get the amount of cuts that were necessary. Uh, this is a more unique opportunity for us to do that, and I think that the House has, uh, at least the folks in the House that, that uh, we speak with, the Republican Study Group and others, have uh, have come up with some pretty reasonable proposals that I think we ought to stick to. And, uh, and uh, it's up to the White House, more so than to us, whether they want to go into default or not. Why, why do we want to put ourselves in a position to say it's our fault if our nation entered into a default? We said, hey, we're willing to lift a debt ceiling, but here are the conditions. We didn't say we're not w willing to lift it. We said we're willing to lift it temporarily under these conditions. If the White House decides it doesn't want to meet those conditions, then it appears to me that they're ultimately responsible for the default, and that's, that's my take on it. My name is Arthur Purvis. I'm the president of a small beleaguered organization called the Fairfax County Taxpayers Alliance. Um, Obamacare is a local issue. Uh, I was at a, a, a Fairfax County Public School uh, town hall where the uh, assistant superintendent for human relations stated, and I'm, I'm quoting, that Obamacare will impose a huge administrative and cost burden on our school system. Um, it seems to me the Republicans have essentially abdicated the fight against Obamacare. Yes, there is Paul Ryan. I don't feel the Republicans have really rallied around him. I don't feel that there's any clear Republican alternative to Obamacare. And I'd just like to suggest three things the Republicans should support, and I'd like your comment on these three things. And also, do you agree that Republicans have abdicated the fight against Obamacare? And the three things are first, both government and private insurance are paying 90% of our medical costs, and so c medical consumers have no incentive to be discriminating consumers. So co-pays and deductibles have to be increased. That's the first thing. Second thing, you should have equal tax treatment of employer-provided and privately purchased medical insurance, so we have more incentive to buy private insurance, and that would also increase competition among insurance companies, because right now most of us are limited to the, the choices our employers the companies our employers choose. And then the third thing is to end and tallow the, the, the requirement that emergency rooms treat all patients 
which is just a formula for shutting down per emergency rooms. Ending EMTALA does not mean ending charity care. The medical profession always has and always will give charity care, but it would give young people an incentive to buy medical insurance. That's a lot. Sorry to take all your time, but my question is, do you have any comment on those three points, and do you agree that the Republicans have essentially abdicated the fight against Obamacare? Yeah. Well, look, in terms of the, uh, the strategy to pursue regarding this health care thing, obviously repealing Obamacare is one of the top priorities, and shame on me for not mentioning it in terms of the first 100 days. I mean, we're basically socializing over 25 percent of our economy, and in essence bringing America to a place that's very hard to return from in terms of being a, you know, being a government-controlled economy to a large percentage. So we, we cannot do that under any circumstances. It's just the beginning of a road of no return uh, in terms of our economic model. So we, we've got to make it a top priority. I thought Republicans, frankly, had some good suggestions before Obamacare was adopted in terms of toward reform, creating a national purchase system for insurance policies. Uh, there were four or five uh, possibilities that, that, without totally overhauling the current system, significantly improved the, uh, the, the choices for the American people and reduced costs. And I think that those ought to be pursued. Now, should Republicans, with zero hope of passing anything, put a full plan on the table at this time? I don't think that's good strategy. All it does is you've got zero chance of passing something, and it gives the other side two more years to take shots at it. Uh, so I'm not a believer for strategic reasons that we need to have a plan on the table because that plan's not going to go anywhere. It just gives the other side a chance to strategize against it. If you want to truly pass a significant plan that uh, gives more power to the consumer, uh, you ought to battle the things that are there now through the appropriations process. I mean, there are a few things we can do to, uh, to slow down Obamacare through the appropriations process, and I think the House chamber should certainly do that. Uh, uh, and uh, it's easier said than done, but, but I think it, it, it can accomplish some modest gains in that regard. But I think, by and large, we ought to have a proposal in our pocket, but I don't see any reason why we should divulge it at this point. Uh, th there's no strategic rationale for it. I mean, I think the reason we need to go into the election cycle explaining to people why Obamacare is bad for America, bad for choices, and bad for the economy. But, uh, but and, and I think there's some things we, we should be able to talk about, but I'm not sure a full plan is something that with zero chance of passage we need to be talking about. I could be wrong, you know, but, but that's my view of it. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Al. Uh, to uh, respond to the question before this, uh, my group, the 60 Plus Association, has just spent its last nickel, $1.4 million, touting the Ryan plan as an alternative, as a way to the future, because we seniors won't have it in about nine or ten more years. And uh, quite frankly, you may have seen the ad recently. We spent a lot of money last year fighting Obamacare, and the very first thing Ryan Care does, of course, is abolish Obamacare. And so we are in the fight. We will continue that fight. And by the way, we want to thank you at the ACU Conservatives are going to be looking to you, Mr. Cardenas, for leadership. We know you're going to provide it. It's an honor to be in your presence today as a fellow Floridian. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> we've, we've looked at the Hispanic community for years with, with um, puzzlement because so many members of that community reflect our values with regard to pro-life, with regard to entrepreneurship, with regard to saving and working hard and all of that. And yet, with the exception of the Cuban community and within the community, the older members of the community, the Cuban community, the Hispanics vote 70, 80, 90 percent for Democrats. Do you have any insights into how we can turn this around? Yeah, I don't think really it's that hard. Uh, I, I, I'm, a, I'm an optimist in that regards, and, and so is our country. Look, in 2010, 
uh, we elected a Hispanic governor of New Mexico, a Hispanic governor of Nevada, a Hispanic statewide senator in the state of Florida, two Republican members of Con Hispanic members of Congress who defeated two Democrat Hispanics in their Hispanic majority congressional district in Texas, a Hispanic in uh, in Idaho, and one in Washington State. And uh, so we gained eight seats. We, we have eight new Hispanic representatives, one new senator, and two new governors, all of whom are committed conservatives. And so, you know, the, from the old Nixon days, I remember with frustration that, that the Nixon administration's goal is, well, you've got to create a separate agenda for Hispanics. You know, give them something. Well, you know, our goal is to find, the key is to recruit very competent people who share our conservative values. And to, and to convince them to run in districts that may or may not be Hispanic majority, you know, like we did in New Mexico and like we did in, in Nevada. But uh, I think if you find the right candidate and they stick by our values and we're willing to support them, um, you know, that's a great formula for success. Which gets me to one of my greatest pet peeves, and that is the national press and the Democrats trying to sell America on the fact that Conservatives are not welcoming of, major of minorities. And yet we have a Herman Cain to the world. We have a people who place on the ballot. We will vote for people based on their values and their talent skills. Uh, we're not believers in quotas, and we're not believers in vote Hispanic if you're Hispanic and vote black if you're black. As a matter of fact, the only people in this country who discriminate are Democrats, who advocate that if you're not a black, you should, you know, uh, but that if you're not... A, a black Democrat, you're not a good black. They call you every which name. And imagine if we did that, started calling people names. Uh, if, if, you know, they claim that if you're a Hispanic and you're not a Democrat, you're, you're, you're a traitor to your community. I mean, these are people who play ethnic politics in a very dangerous way, in a very divisive way in America. As a matter of fact, the Democrat strategy has always been to divide America amongst demographic groups that they feel convenient with, which is very destructive to who we are as a nation. It keeps us from having the assimilation of, uh, and the agreement of a singular culture. It deprives us of the opportunity to be more united. They do more damage to our country by, by these divisive tactics and get totally away with it. So you're treading into an area of a total pet peeve for me, and I'll stand up against any of these hypocrites any given day. And so I'm a big believer that our tent is more than big enough for Hispanics, that I agree with you there's an opportunity for us to grow exponentially. And with the right leadership, we can. Listen, Reagan got 40 percent of Hispanics uh, when he won his, his, his election. And he did it at the time when our threshold was like 20 percent. And so, yes, I believe that's possible, but I believe we ought to fully pursue the opportunity and not be shy about it. Now, when people get into a strategy room and decide that it's hopeless and we're not going to budget to reach a community or something, well, the result uh, is a given. But if you're as enthusiastic as I am that they share our values, then you should pursue it with vigor. And anything you pursue with vigor, I believe we're going to be successful at. morning. Um, I wanted to know what you believe is our next best step toward preserving marriage as a union between one man and one woman. Okay. Well, obviously, it starts with getting the Attorney General to defend our country's laws, which is, in my opinion, his constitutional responsibility. I, uh, I mean, think about it. A president telling his Attorney General that he is not going to defend the law of this country because he doesn't like it. That's, that's a pretty profound, that's a pretty profound thought and, and, and one, frankly, that doesn't sit well with me and I hope with any of you. I mean, there are constitutional responsibilities that you can't conveniently put aside because you don't like a particular point of view. That's what laws are for. It's, that's why a majority governs. So uh, that, that would be a, a big first step. Uh, the second step is, look, this fight is going to be primarily uh, uh, states at the state levels, and, and frankly, the biggest obstacle is going to be a, a proactive judiciary who is going to create rights that are not mandated by a state constitution or legislature 
in order to advocate their points of view, which is what's happening in a number of states. And that gets us back to the fact that one of the great consequences uh, of not winning elections is the appointment of judiciary at all levels that actually will come up with a proactive point of view that's contrary to the will of the American people. And the judiciary is probably the greatest source of potential abuse within our constitutional framework because it's an independent branch. It's, uh, most of these members are not uh, subject to the will of the American people, and, and yet they find themselves in a position of, of abuse of their power by being as proactive as they want to be. Just think of some of the decisions that come out of that, of that uh, court in San Francisco and many others. So, so yeah, I've, you know, the court system uh, can't be a source of concern and, and probably one of the areas of greatest lasting consequences whenever conservatives don't, don't, don't win at the ballot box.